Welcome. Uh, our first speaker at Blue Stamp 2015 Denver. Uh, we have John Vino. He is, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. He's going to talk to you today about all the cool stuff he builds, um, his education, and the neat things that he knows how to do. He's got, an he's got a degree in mechanical engineering, so um, please be sure to ask him plenty of questions. Feel free to interrupt him at any time. Um, and the goal is that you get a chance to kind of back and forth. So if you have a question, you're like, hey, how'd you do that? How'd you get there? What'd you do? Um, don't be shy about raising your hand or calling. So without further ado, John Dina. Hello, everyone. Uh, the introduction. Uh, so I am a mechan I'm a mechanical engineer. I uh, grew up in Cleveland, went to Case Western Reserve. That's how I met Dave, where we had fun with some different projects, including a large trebuchet that threw flaming watermelons into the lake, not at boats. Uh, so as an engineer, you don't just do boring things. You actually occasionally somehow got a pile of money to do silly things like, like that. So um, that was Case. Uh, one of the things I did at Case was uh, I want to put a plug in. This project stuff. So uh, it's one of the it's this really cool race car project where you, uh, where you build a single seat race car from scratch. Um, there's other projects like this at college and high school, like the stuff you're doing here. Uh, it's the things you should be doing. If you want to be an engineer, you gotta get your hands dirty. You gotta like build stuff, do stuff, stuff that you can show somebody that you did that works. That's like gold. So do that. Whatever you think is cool, do. Um, and that's kind of how I got where I'm at. Um, so what I'm doing now is this company called Biosurf Space Technologies. And what we do is help biologists that want to fly experiments to space station uh, in space. So, uh, so I'm a mechanical engineer and make the hardware. So we make all kinds of little contraptions that the astronauts use to conduct these experiments. So it all starts with the scientists that, you know, they have this idea that something's different in space with microgravity. So there's a lot of problems with humans being in space. Uh, the immune system changes, eyesight changes, the fluid shifts. Uh, you come back with like a ton less bone and muscle. So if you wanted to go to something like Mars, for example, you're gonna, have, you're gonna be in space for six months or a year or more, or two years. Um, so you gotta figure these things out so you can well in space, and some of it's actually just for understanding uh, what happens a little bit more on Earth. Uh, things like osteoporosis, you kind of lose bone strength. Um, so studying it in microgravity actually helps them develop drugs that helps osteoporosis, for example. So there's all kinds of cool stuff that they're doing. I don't know half the technical details of biology, because I'm a mechanical engineer, I make nuts and bolts and whatever. Um, so that's what I do. Uh, so I have some slides like can kind of talk about some of these projects, and please like just ask questions because I just want to like give you a sample of like what I do for my job, and it's really really cool. Um, so please. So this is a picture of the last space shuttle after it landed, um, rolling back to the hangar. So part of my job is actually go to KFC and help the scientists load the hardware and the samples, um, and then turn it over. So there was. Uh, we actually had five experiments to go up on the last space shuttle. And I got to be there as part of my job to wrap it all up, turn it over, wave goodbye, and then screw back to Colorado. Um, we're based out of Boulder, and we have an operations control center where we actually talk to the crew members and coordinate all the timing and you know, make sure it's all done correctly. Um, so like, here's a picture of me. One of the things you have to do is tell them exactly how it weighs and where the center of gravity is. So this is a fancy table that they have. And so this is our incubator. There's a standard sized box that we put our payload in. So this is our incubator actually floating on space station with uh, one of our experiments inside. We have a better picture of this, but it's... Uh, Looks like a bunch of TV or not. Yeah, so it's kind of like that. Uh, so it's actually, this is probably the best picture I have. So there's eight test tubes around. You guys seen Jurassic Park? Yeah, so you know how they have the thing where it's like, 
and there's like, it's just like that. And it feels just like that every time I photo this thing. Um, so basically what happens is the scientist loads different fluids, um, so maybe some bacteria that they want to grow in space. And then in the next chamber is the media, so like food, that they want it to grow in. So the, the bacteria is just like sitting there starving, like you, you know, before you ate your pizza. And, um, and you feed it basically and then it grows. And so, you, so that's how they, so they set up the experiments. So you kind of pause everything, get it to space, and then start the experiment, and then they might fix it in some way to kind of freeze it so that they can bring their samples back. And they might actually freeze it. That's one of the ways they do it. And then this outer thing is basically a bulletproof tank that you can like run over with a truck. So it's like a thick polycarbonate wall, there's aluminum end caps, two O-rings. We have to test each O-ring every time we put it together. Uh, but basically the astronaut turns to crank. This is Sunita Williams. Um, so she's, act she's playing with it, actually just kind of spun it and posing for a picture, which is awesome. Astronauts like to play with the camera. They, we often get these kind of cool pictures of them just going around with our stuff. And then we're like, no, you got to hurry up because it's got to get back in the incubator so we don't lose, you know, can't get too cool or, you know, too warm sometimes. So it just depends on what we're doing. But, you know, like, there's no ceiling or floor. All the walls are covered with equipment. So there's, like, just wires hanging off of everything. They have these mounts. That's where they put their laptops. So there's just stuff floating around everywhere in the US lab up there. Um, so this is another, this is kind of my baby. And I have one right here, which you guys should come see. We'll play with afterwards. I can actually drag some dye to show you more, more how this works. So this is something I designed, built, and has flown the space station three times for three different experiments. And it's usually like 20 of these things, which then means there's 20 more ground controls and then two or three sets of backup hardware. So it takes quite a bit to put these things together. So there's this plastic frame in here. Um, so we machine this in-house. We have our own machine shop, which is cool, because we can prototype stuff really quickly and then actually build the flight hardware. Uh, so I could, I could pass this around. Please don't drop this one. Um, so basically, these are ports. You can connect a syringe. Um, so you can like change the media. You can pull samples. Uh, like you can inject a drug once it gets to orbit. So there's like a lot, a lot of different things you can do with this. Uh, but we, like I said, you know, designed and built this thing around what the scientists wanted. Um, so it has to be like biocompatible. Uh, it has to be good gas exchange. So the cells have to breathe. So if you put it in like a sealed box, it's probably not going to do very well. Because they actually do need oxygen and reject CO2. So the membranes are carefully selected around that. Uh, but yeah, it's all just based on like, you know, we had to build it and test it. So there's been probably, I don't know, a dozen scientists that have tried their stuff in here. We've flown three so far. We've got a long line of people that want to use it. So uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, so yeah, just kind of take a look at that. That's kind of a pretty good example of some of the hardware we fly. It's another fun on orbit shot. Just kind of playing with this in the, in the glove bag so that that's like an extra level of containment. So if anything were to leak, this, and, in a bag. This is a box that we built ourselves, so it's basically structural protection for the hardware and uh, in case anything were to leave. Uh, some more fun pictures. It's actually, so this is Garris, he's got this cool suction cup thing on his forehead as part of a human uh, study they were doing at that point. Oh, and then so off of that one, we actually did a six wall version for a different experiment. And this one we actually flew these little worms, which are super creepy when you look at them with the microscope. But um, basically, half of them got normal, they bacteria, and half of them got normal bacteria, and half of them got bacteria that gave them a tummy ache. And then, so we actually, so we pulled samples, and um, also we built the camera system. So, so this is what we get back. Um, we got about 150 gigabytes of videos of worms wiggling around. Which I should have had a video, but I don't know, maybe. Um, so yeah, getting the lighting right, they're translucent. So looking at them under the microscope in water, they're actually really hard to see. Um, so we had to figure all this out. This is a three-axis camera system that can move. Uh, the camera's kind of here, here's the lens, and it can move around. 
uh, inside the incubator on orbit. So we actually plug this in and type in commands in our lab in Boulder to move this thing around and take pictures on the space station in real time. It's really fun. Oh, so here's another cool part I made. Just because this is ridiculous. So this was for a different experiment. Uh, so you can see this picture. It was like a you know, circuit board, but it's a circuit board for fluids. Um, so there's two layers of um, channels in here, and then a million ports on the outside for what it was connected, supposed to connect to. So kind of there's this pr progression. This is actually a getting machine and I've seen some help. Uh, this is me assembling it on the clean bench, and that's like its pre-assembled state. Um, so then it looks kind of more like this. There's a bunch of cultures here. There's kind of bags that have different medias. And then um, basically it goes in this box and it goes in front of this camera. It has LEDs inside the box, and, and there's like several hundred parts that put this thing together. So this was a fun one, um, but I just want to show this because this is like, figure out how you machine this. If you can. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so is anybody, let's, let's pause there. Questions, comments? For any of these projects, do you work as like with a team, or was these all like solo projects? Oh, it's not solo. You can't do any of this by yourself. So we have a team. It's a small team. We have about um, eight full-time staff, and another about eight students, undergrads and graduate students. And that's just our team that does the hardware. And there's an additional science team that's figuring out the bugs and whatever we're putting in it. And then we work with a bunch of people at NASA um, that make sure what we're doing is safe, they coordinate with the crew activities, and actually operate the space station. So there's like, I don't know, to do one of these experiments, there's probably 40 or 50 people involved. How long does it take to put design together? Like, how long does it take to design The typical, so it's typically the scientists have been doing their science for years, but then they'll have an idea for an experiment they have to like propose it to some funding agency like the NIH or NASA has different piles of money. So, so once they get selected and say, what you're doing is cool, we're gonna do this money, you should go do this on Space Station, they get paired up with us. So from that point, it's probably about a year or so before it actually flies. Uh, and then, so that's kind of our project duration, but then after that, they get their samples back and they might do a year or years of studying the samples, trying to figure out what they might do next. This is in parallel with all their ground studies and playing that they're doing. But for us, it's about a year. Yeah. Where'd you go to college at? Case Western Reserve, in Ohio. Oh, okay. uh, it's a pretty good engineering school. It's a private school. Uh, but there's still plenty of opportunities for these, uh, these projects that I was talking about. Yeah. How did you get into, um, like, from, how did you get from, like, mechanical engineering to, like, biology space. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of like the path for me was kind of, the, the next obvious step was always kind of just something from me. So I, I got a job at the Cleveland Clinic during my undergraduate. So in parallel with school, I would do this job. And so like when there was school, it might have been 10 hours a week, but then I'd break some stuff I could more. Um, so basically it was a machine shop that built prototype medical devices. So I got to build like widgets like that and all kinds of different stuff. Um, that doctors had ideas, there's a biomedical lab. So that was like an internship or co-op basically that I did throughout school. And that gave me a lot of background that uh, gave me to this current job. So I'm still a uh, mechanical engineer, like to build and thinkers and kind of stuff. But this like reaching out into other fields is important as an engineer. So that's, depending on what you're doing, like you, you at least are going to work with other kinds of engineers, if not people that do people with different science or whatever. So you have to kind of learn how to speak other people's language. It's an important thing to do as an engineer. You never stop learning. It's like a new thing. How do you make a flaming watermelon? Uh, that I'm going to have to let you figure out on your own. Or don't do that. That's extremely dangerous. I don't recommend that you make flaming watermelons. <laughs> Yeah, like, how does like the tubing for that work in terms of machining? Because like I get the CNC routing. Like, what? 
So that's actually machined as three layers of plastic. Okay. So you can cut the grooves, and then you basically squish it together. So it's really hard to do. There's a couple of ways we tried to do it. One was with a solvent bomb, which basically, like uh, car models or something like that, you can glue together with a little solvent and then it evaporates. Um, so we tried that, which basically, um, it's really hard to get the solvent out of the inside, and then it cracks oh, okay. crazy. So that's what's called thermally diffusion bonded. So basically, you take two pieces of plastic and just put a little bit of heat and pressure and some time and squeeze it together. So there's a company that we contracted to get that done. They did an amazing job. Okay, so you do half of you do half of the like channel in yeah. the CNC, and then you do on the other side of the other half, and then, and then you can squish it together. That's cool. There are other ways to make microfluidic channels like that. Why not 3D printing? Good. Um, so 3D printing would be a great way to make something like that. Uh, it's not really a solid part. There's a lot of porosity and holes. So trying to make the seals work on the bottom line. Or now you just have a ton of bottom lines essentially on a 3D printed part. So for like autoclaving and like really good smooth surfaces, it's not very good for biologicals. So, yeah, it just really wasn't a good option. Um, there is like a uh, an etching method where you actually, there's some plastics you can basically, just like how you make a circuit board, uh, block out some of the areas and then uh, chemically kind of melt the plastic away. And then you can actually combine that, uh, what was it? Some of these are actually like grown too, more like a 3D printed part, it's like a UV, Oh, the, uh, the uh, bath? Yeah. The one that's the um, resin bath? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So they've, they've done it that way with reasonable success. But like the key is that that's an autoplayable part, which is a high temperature steam process. So not very many polymers are actually that good at that. So that's what we ended up with, combined with all the other packaging stuff. Uh, it worked out well. Any other questions? Uh, so I have, oh, so then I'll show you this. So this, you guys know what ABC is, it's SparkFun. Uh, so it's, it's an autonomous vehicle competition. Oh yeah. yeah. Little yeah. robots driving around, all the snow cycles, Dutch obstacles. They used to have a flying competition. Uh, and now they're actually having a little battle bot side things here. So it's pretty cool, it's in Boulder, or outside of Boulder, you should check it out. Uh, so that's our robot from last year. And I have one video from the first. So we built this thing, we tested it, we were pretty sure it was going to work. Um, so this is the first time in competition. <laughs> so it was the fastest robot there by far. These other guys we were kind of chasing more of the time and decided to quit. Um, so there, there was quite the reaction, because we were like probably two or three times faster than everybody else, but it totally clipped the concrete bucket right on the corner. And the wheels are spinning, and it's tearing its tires to bits. Uh, yeah, so this is, I just did this last year, so I think it's still, uh, never so stopped playing. So the course was by far the fastest? Yeah, we actually set the course record, so that's <laughs> right. I don't know if I'm going to be back this year. But uh, highly recommend it, good time. Oh, so then I didn't really talk about like, so in microgravity, it's really challenging to like manipulate fluids. So that's like the hardest part. So in, in the lab, you've got gravity, so you can like pipette something from one little cup to another little cup, and it's really quite easy. In space, uh, surface tension dominates, and it doesn't go down, so these little droplets are just kind of going wherever. So this is Chris Atfield, he's a crew member that likes to play. So he's demonstrating wringing out this towel and what happens. So you can actually see the water doesn't go anywhere, it just kind of comes out of the towel and it's like wicking all up into his hands and up his arms. So for the stuff that we build, we have to figure out ways to keep the liquid where we want. Uh, so it's always like a contained, flexible chamber or like uh, like a piston that moves to kind of move the liquid around. You can't just like up the liquid and put it somewhere else because it doesn't do anything. So biologicals is one of the things that's studied, but like material science, combustion, 
has just seen the picture of the candle burning in microgravity. That's the good one. Uh, so they do a lot, and that that combined with all the research that's done on the ground gives you this greater context of how physics works, how all these different things work. Um, so that's why you do research in microgravity. So it's really really cool that we have this lab, and now it's time to use it for something before it one day when they decide it's no longer useful. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, figure out a shit at that because that's just kind of crazy. You can see the, the water is stuck to his hand and not it doesn't drip off, it just kind of sticks to everything. So YouTube has a ton of awesome videos, so if you just Google like astronauts, whatever, you just find a series of them playing with stuff. There's one of a coffee cup that they flew on. Oh, yeah. Mission. I want so to figure like, out how that works. Yeah, so basically using this to their advantage, they have a large kind of rounded section and then a sharper crease that goes to the corner. So they actually use this in like fuel tanks for rockets um, to keep the liquids where they want because they have liquid fuels. Uh, you have to have the fuel by the pickup, otherwise it's not a very good fuel. Um, so yeah, they used the same principle to make these coffee cups. They flew like eight different kinds, and they wanted to play like, test with them and play with them. Uh, so take pictures. There was actually like a science component to it. Um, oh, here's the camera. This is what happens on YouTube. It's extremely dangerous. Um, so yeah, it basically draws it up the sharp corner to, to where you drink from, and you can just completely drink a cup of water, which you can see is not. Um, super intuitive. That's extremely dangerous. Um, you know, watching all those videos on YouTube just loads your new one. It's actually fine. Yeah, no, so like, but if the one, like, the coffee or whatever, like, follows the crease in the top, right? It goes to sharp corners. The way surface tension works is like sharper radiuses will draw the liquid up with like a caliper force. You can actually draw liquid uphill. But it's a lower potential energy state, basically. So it's not like it's being pushed uphill. It's actually going downhill, even though it's going up away from you. If that makes any sense at all. Yeah, it's I like a fluid. Yeah, it's, I don't understand the force. Yeah. So you can actually get things to do like yeah. So I think what you're saying like a. They do like a ramp up a hill. Yeah. So the center of gravity goes down, but it rolls up. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, so you can get, yeah, physics is kind of the, it, it decides what's going to happen and not happen. <laughs> um, so like like tops and things, there's all these different kinds of like weird cases of uh, how things move around and they're not necessarily very intuitive. Like when you spin something, will it stably spin like a football or will it wobble away? And it all has to do with math tells you if it's going to work or not. Um, anyways, <laughs> I could talk later on just about dynamics of satellites and stuff. But any other questions? How expensive is it to fly stuff into space? Um, so it's pretty expensive. The space shuttle was really expensive at the end, and that was kind of the reason I got ended. So it's probably on the order of $25,000 a pound or something, $50,000 a pound. So quite a bit just for the launch cost. And that's actually getting much, much better. So there's companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX that are building commercial vehicles at a much, much lower price than what NASA can do. Because NASA's building things always on the cutting edge and trying to make these great things. But so these commercial companies ask the question, why do you need a Ferrari to go to space when you can do it with a Honda Accord? So they're trying to do it for like $10 million instead of 100 or $10 million, which, so that cost goes down drastically. And that allows you to do more of this stuff. So like the stuff that I've showed, that I've showed you, like the flower has gone up on SpaceX Dragon, which is this commercial company. So it's, it's getting cheaper, and they're doing things like trying to land a rocket on a barge. Yeah, so you guys should check this out. Oh, no. um, so there's, so typically what happens when you launch a rocket to space, space, you need multiple stages. 
Um, so you get about halfway up, and then the first stage falls into the ocean. And there's nothing you can do to get it back because it's falling from like 10 or 20 miles up and hitting the water. And it's this red, it's basically an aluminum can hitting the water. So you're not going to get it back, and now it's in the bottom of the ocean. So there's hundreds of rockets in the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean off of Florida. Um, but if you could figure out a clever way to get it back and use it, get it back to uh, Florida, uh, all you have to do is fill it up with fuel again. So potentially at 10% the cost, with a little bit of you know, check it out and make sure it's all still working, you could just fly it again. So that's what these companies are trying to do. Uh, SpaceX started it, and, uh, well, I think it started. There's a couple of companies that started it, and now everybody's kind of trying to make this cheaper. And all this is going to do is make, like universities are going to be flying satellites to do <coughs> science missions. It depends on the dollar, but they can do that. So like getting satellites to orbit, getting people want to fly to space. So like Bigelow Aerospace is making these inflatable habitats. It's basically a hotel. They're going to use it for science and whatever. So it's like, here's this thing you can go hang out here. It's this big, their big one is actually probably about the size of this room uh, is what they want to fly. Potentially, it's a candidate for the Mars mission. So now you got a bunch of space put stuff and keep your food and water um, and you know, have some space to live. But this could also be used in public orbit and you can go hang out in space. Um, it won't be cheap. It won't ever be like, you know, going to the beach or something. But for for some, you know, the wealthy people potentially this is something that you can go see what it's like to be in space for a week or something. And this is something people have done. Uh, the Russians have actually offered flights to like some actors and but yeah, so they just go up and play in space and have a few of their own little experiment things that they brought. I'm gonna look out the window and take some pictures and take that. So it's like the future. <laughs> it's cool. Oh, well, I okay, will stop there. More questions? Is there any more? Cool. Well, thanks for letting me talk to you guys.